My name is Giles Smith, and welcome to our community. I'm Robert McKernan, San Bernardino County Museum Director, and I welcome you to the Victor Valley Museum. Um, it is probably the, one of the gems of the high desert, and uh, the museum is owned by San Bernardino County, and it's in the museum system. We have the main facility in Redlands and six branch historic sites, and the Victor Valley Museum. This museum is, uh, it was built in 1993, uh, it was run by a nonprofit, and then in 2010, the Board of Supervisors for San Bernardino County adopted it within the museum system. So we we are very excited uh, as a county organization to maintain this facility. It's about 14,000 square feet, about 6,000 square feet of exhibits, and what our theme is is discover your backyard, the high desert. Um, and that ranges from state line Nevada, Arizona, all the way to the mountains of San Bernardino and the San Gabriel Mountains. And we interpret history, biology, geology, paleontology, and anthropology. And all of our exhibitions and our educational programs are based on common core standards through the state of California. So we feel that we are a, a non-formal education center for K through 12 as well as lifelong learning. So we're standing here in our area that is history and as, as you all know the high desert has wonderful history local and regional history from mining to railroad um, and really about uh, and water and then people that settled here and through through the years and so what we've tried to do here is is interpret not only the the famous because everybody that worked in the high desert a hundred years ago or 50 years ago is famous so we have a community wall that depicts um, the various cities and areas in the high desert uh, especially the west west mojave desert Obviously, we have an emphasis on Apple Valley, because Apple Valley really was the Palm Springs um, of Southern California uh, in the 40s and 50s and 60s. Wonderful, wonderful history there. So we do have that, and this is a constantly changing exhibition. All of the material you're going to see today is, is from the archives of the county, county museum. So whether it be geology, paleontology, history, all of this material, um, the 2D, a 2D is a photograph, or 3D, which is an actual object, comes from our collections. And one critical thing about the San Bernardino County Museum is that we're an accredited institution. What does that mean? That means that we get reviewed by our museum peers, um, we have formal educational programs. Um, we, can, um, we can get grants from the federal and state agencies. Um, and we have best practices and best interpretation for materials here. So accreditation is very important. And, and one fact is only 10% of museums in North America are accredited and your institution, and this is your institution, is accredited. So we're very proud of that. Uh, we thank the Board of Supervisors um, and county government for letting us um, turn this into the gym of the high desert. Well, we're, we're walking through the history section of the Victor Valley Museum, and this just gives you an example of um, what we're, what we're displaying here. This is a, a, a farm, farm implement. Uh, it's a plow, um, horse-drawn, 
Um, and what we try to do is we have this static object, but then we also try to interpret the people that used it. Where did they live? How did they live? What did they grow? Why did they grow that? The commodity. Um, and these are water pipes. So in the early days of um, the development of the high desert, obviously we're a desert. We're about, oh, average rainfall is about six inches or less. So we are an arid desert out here in the high desert. And to grow crops, you have to get water there to drink, uh, uh, to have drinking water. So these were some of the early um, pipes, and they're wood, but, but they, they transferred water from one point to another. So, and, and again, it's not just about this object, it's about who used the object. That's what's so important. I'll say it's a point in time. So this morning, when you look at something through our museum, think about it as a point in time. This, this implement was made for agriculture, but why? What, what were they using? Um, who was using it? Where was the agricultural be, uh, agriculture being cultivated here in the, in, in the desert? And where was the water being distributed? So it's all about that period. It's not just about the object. It's about the culture um, that uh, utilized these and developed these technologies of the day. Well, uh, again, we're, we're transversing through our history section. And um, we do uh, have an exhibition about a, a famous couple, and you, you, you all know, uh, for those that are young or old, you've all heard of uh, uh, Dale and Roy Rogers. And again, up there, that lead-in is High Desert's royal family, and they were. They, they lived here, they were famous Hollywood figures, um, but they, did, they did, did live here and make this their point of origin. So, there's so much, so much memorabilia, and we'll be changing this out over time, but this is just um, garments that, that show uh, what they used, and you've probably seen these in movies, uh, old, old Western movies, um, boots, and so on, and their old ranch, just a depiction, a model of their old ranch. So we do, this is a very important group because they formulated, that's why people came to the high desert of uh, 50s, 60s. They knew that Dale and Roy were out here. So um, with that, a very important, uh, a very important icons uh, in the high desert, and we do uh, interpret that. And again, a point in time. Think about it as a point in time um, and um, how they lived and what they did uh, for, for the high desert and actually for the film industry uh, of the world. Okay, now we're, we're moving into another section of the Victor Valley Museum, and this is the hard rock geology. What is hard rock geology? Well, we all know in the high desert and the deserts of, south, of the southwest that mining is very important. It's an it's a economic uh, interest to the county uh, of San Bernardino and to the southwest. And so what we made is we made a, a if you will, a, a mine shaft type uh, facade here to have patrons transition into uh, this, this geology room. Um, what you have here is this photograph is probably most of you know what that is, but that's Mitsubishi Mine that's up uh, in Lucerne Valley on the back side of the San Bernardinos. A, 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 an important industry, uh, an important corporation in the high desert. Um, so we depict that and some of the minerals. And come on and let's walk in uh, and see, we have some wonderful, wonderful uh, minerals here. And again, all of these minerals have been extracted in the high desert and tell a story uh, about the diversity of the geology of the high desert. Those um, panels that you see depict certain um, aspects of mineralogy. And so students and families, lifelong learning, folks can come in and get some idea of what is a mineral, what is a rock, um, how do they differ. Um, this, is, this is one of our famous little, uh, it's, a, you know, it's a geode and it's probably one of the larger ones, but uh, um, wonderful, wonderful crystal 
um, in here. So just just gives you a sense, and and I can't explain it all because there are so many different minerals in here, of so many different colors, shapes, and and also locations and uses. Think about minerals being used for a variety of things, just like Mitsubishi mine and a variety of other mines that that mine sand and gravel. Well, without sand and gravel, we wouldn't have a we wouldn't have pavement, uh, we wouldn't have or uh, concrete, and so you wouldn't have a driveway. So think about that. Um, and again, we talk about the point in time. Who, you know, in, in the year, 100 years ago, who was mining in the high desert, and why were they mining? What were they looking for? Obviously, gold and silver, but there's other commodities, other mineral, mineral commodities that are is significant. Um, for example, in the eastern Mojave Desert, the Mollycourt mine, it, um, it mines rare minerals. And really, outside of China, uh, Mollycorp is the only location where those rare, rare minerals come out of the ground. So, um, mining industry is a over a billion dollar industry in, um, in the desert. Um, it's an important, um, you know, economic uh, as, as a you know an economic aspect as well as just a fascinating science aspect um, so please come and see our mineral room our geology room and I think you'll learn something fascinating and have a greater respect for the high desert okay now we've moved out of the geology room and we're into the area of the paleontology fossils and I know everyone loves fossils and the high desert is is a is a wonderful resource for fossils, ice age fossils, those that are uh, during the Pleistocene period. And so what you see here are two areas, the Barstow fossil beds. Barstow fossil beds out near Barstow, California, are absolutely a wonderful area to interpret the, the prehistory of this area. And, and our scientists at the county, county museum um, have been working at the Barstow fossil beds for decades. And another area that we have is the rocks of the Cajon Pass. The rocks of the Cajon Pass are absolutely wonderful because when you think of the Cajon Pass, what I think of is the biology, but also I think of the geology. We have the San Andreas Fault that runs through. And the San Andreas Fault has changed um, the Southern California in so many different ways. It has made the mountains lift and so what in looking at fossils we can get some idea of the history of the terrain the landscape um, the climate there's all these different like climate change we've heard a lot about climate change well fossils can tell you where they're found in the ground a lot about fossil about uh, climate uh, climate change and this this is an extinct camel from Cajon Pass and in, when you watch the TV, movies, and so on, you think, well, fossil, or camels were only in the Middle Eastern countries, Northern Africa. Well, well actually, the if camels used to be an indigenous animal here in uh, the southwestern North America. And this one comes from uh, the Cajon Pass, and it's, uh, it's about a million years old. And that's an actual fossil. Um, it's been taken out of the ground by uh, our scientists. And, and the white, um, I'll call it plaster, just basically keeps, keeps the structure together. And what you're looking at is the, the, the top dentition or the teeth of the molar. This is the, the nose out here. And so that's, that's the top of the head. And so the scientists found that broken off in the, you know, in the dirt um, in, in a, a excavation and then have put it back together for exhibition. And one thing that I think we'll all be fascinated with is right over here, we have a mastodon that came from Victorville, the, what's called the Victorville fan, which is a, a dry uh, um, stream course. Um, and it's, it's a fully, really a kind of a, intact um, this is the this is the forehead they, these are the molars 
And this is the actual, this was excavated in 1993 by scientists at the County Museum. And what, what's, um, it's a fun fact is that we had it at the County Museum in Redlands since 1993, but when we opened, reopened the Victor Valley Museum, um, we took it as the Victor Valley Mammoth Comes Home. And here he is, um, and a great, and it's actual, it's an actual, it's not a, a cast, it's an actual bones of the mastodon. So um, it gives you a sense, um, and again, um, some uh, 60,000, 70,000 year old, something about that, but it kind of gives you a sense of what the climate was. It was, it was uh, more humid, um, a, a more moist, a moist, moist environment, because when you think about it, if you think about an analogy of, of African elephants, um, when you see them in, on, an, on, the, on, on the Discovery Channel, they're in arid savanna plains, but there's got to be water nearby. And so mastodons were quite plentiful out in certain areas of the desert. And, and it tells us that the desert was uh, uh, a, a wetter environment during the period in which they lived. So fossils tell you so much about the past, not only what the animal is, but also how it lived. And, and we can make common comparisons to animals of present day and get some good idea what landscapes are about. And also in these fossil digs, they not only find animal fossils, they, they find plant fossils. So you have a good idea of connecting the dots, if you will, relative to how that plant, does it, does it need water or doesn't it? And that fossil was right nearby. Therefore, we can make some, uh, we can, we can make, get some answers about climate uh, in, in, our, uh, in our high desert. That's why paleontology is such a, a wonderful science because it tells us so much. Well, now we've moved into modern biology. Uh, I was just talking about paleontology. Right now, it's modern biology. And some of you are probably looking behind uh, my left shoulder saying, what's a muxox doing here, a, a, an animal that lives in the high Arctic uh, with all this hair and this large, large animal that looks almost buffalo-like? Um, well. The reason why it's here is what I talked about earlier with the less than six inches of rainfall and if, and if you drive with mom and dad or you drive to grandma's house uh, to uh, Hesperia or to Barstow, you see creosote bush grub. You see it pretty, you know, there are not a lot of plants out there. And, but there's a lot of animals that live in that environment, the arid environment. So why we have the muskox here is, is that this animal has adapted to high Arctic conditions. Very cold conditions for most of the year, only six to 12 weeks out of the year, is it, is it pleasant, if you will. So you see this hair, it, it's, it's evolved and created adaptations to live in that environment. And at the same time, animals here have done the same thing. A lot of the desert animals are not daytime active, they're nighttime active. Well, why is that? Well, because we all know that it gets over 100 degrees, 110 degrees um, during uh, summer months here. And so animals have adapted for nighttime conditions, cooler, cooler conditions uh, at night. Also, they've adapted to hibernation or torpor, which is a form, form uh, of hibernation. We all know like the desert tortoise, uh, the desert tortoise is a cold-blooded animal but um, and, and is out from maybe April through October at the latest, but then when it gets cold, it's underground. And actually it will go through certain periods of what I'm going to call hibernation, but torpor, even in the summer months when it gets too darn hot, so or if there's lack of resources, vegetation, and so on. So what we're trying to do is put a perspective, discover your backyard, and, we have, and we're using some things that don't necessarily occur in your backyard, but you can get an analogy of how 
arid environments like the desert and the Arctic environments are similar in the sense that bird, or animals have to adapt. And this is just one example of, of this hairy creature and very thick uh, uh, hair, uh, pelage, that uh, the animal has adapted to live. And actually, when it's 30, 40 degrees below zero, it's real comfortable, real comfortable because of that mat of hair, or the series of mats of hair. Um, and, if we, and if we look down here, we have a rodent. It's actually a kangaroo rat, a Merriman's kangaroo rat, common animal in the high desert. Um, and it lives in burrows. Probably if you're out walking um, uh, in the desert, you'll see a lot of uh, burrows, that, that hole in the ground. And this animal has adapted. It's a nocturnal creature, and active at night, um, uh, basically in its burrow during the day. It, it's a seed eater. Uh, it has pouches on either side of its cheek, collects seed, eats them, or takes them back to its burrow. And it's, it, some rodents will go through a torpor or hibernation for a couple months. Some are active all year round um, at night. But this animal has adapted to an arid environment just as this animal has adapted to an arctic environment. So we want to make that comparison talk about um, is one of the exhibits um, that we depict a typical Mojave Desert habitat. That's a Joshua trees, the Joshua trees and the yuccas and the cacti habitats we see if we're driving to Barstow, if we're driving to Baker, uh, and actually on to Las Vegas. But within this environment, um, it's, it's a really incredible, diverse and, uh, uh, environment. And what you'll see here is, you know, everything from a coyote to a tortoise to an antelope ground squirrel, to a Mojave ground squirrel, to a ring-tailed cat. It's, it's similar, it's in the same family as a raccoon, nocturnal, big eyes, and it's an insect eater, and it lives in rocky outcrops in the desert. Um, and just, uh, we have a, a, a jackrabbit, um, the black-tailed jackrabbit, also, a, a, the badger, American badger, which is becoming rarer and rarer in the desert, but they live in burrows, and they're actually kind of a ferocious thing where they, they dig with the, if, if you would see their feet and, and, uh, or their, their paws, you will see that they have long nails for digging, and they dig, dig up prey. They'll eat rodents, uh, insects, whatever they can get their hands on, if you will. We have a golden eagle, which is an absolutely uh, wonderful specimen. Golden eagles, again, are uh, rare raptors, birds of prey in the desert, uh, but they do still occur. Um, and what's interesting is that that home range, a home range is like where it lives, is oh, a hundred. It can be a hundred square miles where that that bird needs to find prey uh, and to, um, to, li to live out its life history. So, um, and then up here uh, in the yucca, we have just a series of small songbirds that some, of, like the cactus wren are resident, and, but then we have a hummingbird, um, a costas hummingbird, which is a seasonal resident, comes here just for the spring, summer, and then will we'll migrate into Mexico. We have a, that reddish breasted uh, bird there is a house finch, it's a resident. But then if you move up the tree, you'll see that blue headed, white breasted lazuli bunting. Again, it's another summer resident, only lives about four months out of the year here, and then winters in Mexico um, for the duration of the winter. Um, and then up top, you'll see that a male western tanager, which is a bird that really just migrates through the area. So we're trying to give, a, give the patrons a sense of how wonderful the resources here, and also there's so many other resources that uh, I believe that, that the residents of the high desert should also utilize, not only the Victor Valley Museum, but 
uh, the Mojave uh, Preserve, which is um, actually one of the most um, pristine and uh, uh, preserves in North America, and um, various uh, aspects to the landscape and and really the seasonal change. This comes from the Mojave Desert. Look at all those flowers. Well, that's above average or normal rainfall. Um, I'm sure you've all seen the poppies in uh, uh, LA, uh, LA County and other areas. Well, we all also have a, a variety of plant species that occur that are quite interesting. Some 276 or 280 species of plants that, are, that, that occur in the Mojave Desert. Um, so an absolutely diverse and wonderful, wonderful environment. So this is just one aspect that you can see. And, and, and really, think about when, when you come through the institution, you look at modern day animals and then walk back over to paleontology and get a perspective. Uh, this kind of depicts a, more, you know, a, a really kind of an arid, more arid, modern day environment where some of those fossils uh, depict a, a, a wetter and a cooler climate.